case with my phone. <laughs> so, but here's the verse that was coming to me, that the, 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 and it's, it's a paradigm shift. I really do think that our generation is going to do some. Typically, older people can't do this. Typically, what the Lord does is he takes a new wineskin, a new generation, and, and, he, and he pours into them a movement. But you know, there is a move in the last days where the uh, old men dream, dream dreams and young men see visions. And, and so what you have is you have a, a double generational phenomena happening. And I, I'm not saying that we're the last generation. I'm saying that we've now entered the threshold where that phenomenon is going to stick around. I believe that the generations will move together. Because this, because this is this is the this is the signature of the hour that we're in, and and that means that we are not going to be stuck in a paradigm. And I realize that I think my generation is really is really going through in the United States in the last two years. I think we're going through civics 101. Well, I'm learning stuff I never knew. I, I I mean, think about this. I I didn't know. I mean, I taught seven hours, but I had no idea that news is actually manufactured. I thought it was just, I don't know what I thought, but, but I realize now that news is actually manufactured. It's a frightening thing when the power of journalism is manufactured. And so I've had this idea, and I really, I think you guys can fight it with me. We need to fight this thing. We need to break it. And I used to have this idea that the bride of Christ, terrible as an army with banners coming out of the wilderness to her beloved, I used to think that that was a spiritually focused crowd that was so immersed and in love with Jesus and so detached from the order of things on earth that they were literally living in this zone of intimacy, fasting, prayer, spiritual uh, life, in the, like a bubble. And then, and then as I started to, to, to come out of the fog on this, I realized that the Lord's ideal is that the bride always has on her heart what is on the heart of the bridegroom. And the bridegroom has on his heart the harvest that is in the earth. Therefore, a true bride is living to fulfill the earnest longing of the bridegroom, not her longing to leave and be with him, but his longing for the harvest that is in the earth, which is, which is the harvest. But then I'm updating that now to realize it's not just a harvest of souls, because a harvest of souls is a very ambiguous phenomenon. You cannot measure a harvest of souls. Uh, let, me give, let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, when we talk about, when the Lord says about going to all the world and make disciples of nations, you can tell if a nation's discipled by how it treats Jesus. And so you can measure that. But I was looking at data from Joe Lowstein and Reinhard Bunke and Joyce Myers and and the Billy Graham Association, and I'm looking at the data of the harvest, and I'm realizing the entire world has already been saved four times. <laughs> All the reports are telling me the harvest is like massive out there, but I'm realizing there's no way of quantifying that, but there is a way to quantify if a nation is being transformed. Because you could tell if the nation is being transformed by how it treats uh, the gospel, how it treats Christians, how it treats religious liberty. And here's my challenge to you. I believe the true bride is terrible as an army because they're actually, the bride is actually showing up where the gates of hell are located and is doing warfare for the minds and hearts of nations. It's a warfare over the influencing of nations. It's a warfare over the nations. And I'm telling you, this is not going to be easy because people are coming to our table today and, and like Mercedes was saying, Lance, a lot of people don't know who you are. Well, that's, that certainly is true. A lot of people don't know who I am. So, so I came into the kingdom uh, I'm the first generation saved in my household. My dad was a, a cigar smoking, Lincoln Continental Drive, and World War II vet oil man. And so he was not a Christian, but he took me to the Episcopal Church. I went to the Episcopal Church. My mom was Catholic. Now, at this time, my father never told me that on his side of the family, there were like rabbis and Jews because he was hiding that information from me. Then I, I get saved. I get saved because my dad, who raises me in the oil business, trains me for business. I worked in, uh, with a, we had a Fortune uh, 500 company. I was a trained uh, guy in the oil industry. And, but my dad had sent me to military school. And he sent me there to get me away from theater because he thought I would never make a living on a stage. <laughs> so he didn't think that was real work. And so uh, he sent me away to a military school to get straightened out. And when I was in military school, which is like a really weird environment. You know, no girls are there, no parties, no fun, no nothing. Everybody yelling at you all the time, and your hair is shaved off, and you're wearing these uniforms. So, and I remember it was, I was desperate. I was miserable there. 
and I cried out, God, if there is a God, make yourself known to me. And I'd say within a matter of two weeks, there was a campus crusader standing outside of my barracks in the middle of the winter, which means that he had to walk right past guards who were blinded, who didn't see him. Because we have armed guard, we have guards at every post. Like Valley, Valley Forge Military Academy is like the eighth most um, prestigious military high school and junior college in the country. It prepares you for West Point. So these, this, these two evangelists came in and walked right past these guards who weren't even seen. And they're standing outside of my barracks. Out of 20 barracks, they're outside of mine. And I came back and, and I was walking and it's snowing. It's snowing. It's Valley Forge. This is where George Washington, you know, the history of the Valley Forge. And so it's snowing. And these two guys are standing there with kind of long hair and jeans. And I thought, what in the world? I so go up to one of the guys and said, what are you doing here? I was envious, of course, that he was, he was free, and I wasn't. And he said, he said, I just walked here. I said, it's impossible. You can't just walk here. It's like a military base. I go, what are you doing here anyway? If, you, if I could do anything, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out there. And then I look, I go, oh, what's this? And he shows me, he said, he's the four spiritual laws. So I take it, I go, oh, let me see. Oh, you're a religious fanatic. Oh, my gosh, a religious fanatic. Let me see. So I'm opening up. I go, you, you believe this, right? So meanwhile, I'm talking to him because I'm intrigued with him being there. And I say, you got to get out of here, man. It's not even safe for you to be here. You're a nice guy. You're religious. I get it. And so meanwhile, these cadets are packing snowballs. And I'm sorry to say, they're hitting the other guy over there who's taking all the shots because this one's talking to me. So he's talking to me. And next thing you know, uh, he's showing, I said, all right, you're not going to go till I see this. Show me the presentation. So I have him show me the four spiritual laws. And while he's going through them, I'm kind of getting convicted because I thought I was a Christian because you don't know you're a Christian if you're, until you become one. You know what I mean? You really, it's, it's confusing, trust me. So I'm going, oh, yeah, this is, a, this is a different kind of Christian. It's a real fanatic Christian. That's what you are. So I'm looking at this, and, and then it gets to the point where uh, I, I get the idea about this throne is in the middle, and it's got all this disjointed interest around it, and then it's the ego is on the throne, and then there's one with a cross, and everything's in symmetry. He says, which one of these are you, the ego or the cross? What's on the throne of your life? Well, obviously, it wasn't the cross. I said, well, I guess it's this one. And he goes, well, let's pray. Now, this is the moment. This is, the, this is important to know. There is a moment when you bring people into a prayer or an encounter with God, try to get there no matter what the conversation is because the Holy Spirit shows up so much more powerfully the moment you bring God into the conversation for an experiential moment. And the Lord will show up even if they don't get healed, they get zapped. Something will happen. So, so he goes, let's pray. And I said, pray. And I look up and now I got my little pack of wolves there and they're all wondering what I'm doing and they're throwing snowballs at that poor guy. And I go, here? In that moment, I get convicted that I'm a sinner because I was ashamed of Jesus and didn't want to pray in front of my friends. Up until then, I thought I was a Christian, so I realized I was embarrassed to know Jesus in front of them. And as I'm getting convicted, uh, these demonic cadets in the second floor dump a, a bucket of water outside the window, and they drench my evangelist in water. And he's standing there, half his body soaking wet. I jump back. I go, whoa, 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 it's really getting wild here now. And he looks at me as completely placid, as though he was like, on, you know, like, like the Apostle Paul. He said, our message has been resisted for 2,000 years. They've crucified us, burned us alive, drowned us. This is nothing. If you're willing to talk to me, I'm willing to stay here. And that moment, I step back. I'm supposed to be in the leadership academy. I'm supposed to be the trained future leaders in military. And I look at him, and I look at me, and I look at my goofball friends. I go, my God, this guy is a mile taller than any of us. I said, oh, what am I going to do? i got to pray with him. So I go over to pray with him because he was modeling something that made me want to identify with it even if it was persecuted. So I said the prayer. And I said most of the prayer. I think I got a little distracted halfway because I was keeping one eye on the wolves out there. But uh, I prayed. When I got done, I got zapped. I got something happened to me. And I remember I stepped back. I go, whoo. Because it was like, phew, went right through here. I said, whoa, what was that? He said, well, Jesus just came into your heart. I said, you're kidding me. That, see, it sounds, like, it sounds like a greeting card. 
Let Jesus in your heart have, you know, love in your heart, have faith in your heart. And so I say, so I'm thinking, oh my God, this thing's actually something came, it's like a substance went into me. He said, yeah, right. Jesus is in your heart. I go, literally, that's what it's me. He goes, yeah, literally. I go, oh my God. So I had an experience, and then he goes to me, well, you know, you're just beginning now. And uh, he's wiping the water out of his eyes. He said, look, we got a lot you got to learn. I mean, we have to get together. We have to have a Bible study. I'm going to follow up on this. Go, you don't understand. It's a miracle you got here. It's a miracle we've had this conversation. If I'm not mistaken, it'll be a miracle if I ever see you again. At that moment, military police came by, swept him by the armpits, and dragged him and his poor friend out, who was taking a lot of hits so I could get saved. And boom, off they went, their feet leaving a trail in the snow. I never saw the guy again. He's out there somewhere. I'll meet him. He has no idea what happened that day. He went back and said, well, I pray with some cadet there. I never got his name. I can't get back in there. Every time I go, there's some guard saying, you can't come here. So uh, I went wandering around looking for Christians. I don't know if you know this. We're a really big movement, but we're kind of like ninjas out there. <laughs> I mean, once you're a Christian, you kind of pick up on the clues, you know, the, the fish on the bumper sticker. A few things. Give, we know what to look for if you're in the underground. But I couldn't find a Christian. And I was going to people I thought were Christians, like ministers and stuff. No, I'm serious. I go on Sunday down to some local church. I go, I wait till the guy got done talking. I pull him aside. I say, hey, hey, you ever say a prayer and get zapped really hard? I mean, that's all I know. It was my theology. I didn't know it was the Bible. I just say you pray something, you get zapped. You know, this, you, know you pray a prayer and get zapped. And people, they weren't getting it. They were not getting it. So it wasn't until I, I, two years later I ran into a Christian. Thank God. A guy wandered around carrying a Bible. I, I, was just a, I was accosting people that they looked like they were had anything to do with Jesus. It's like, hey, you ever say a prayer and get zapped? That was my whole theology. He goes, yeah, sure. You're born again. I go, what? What's it called? Born again. I go, there's some more of us? Oh, yeah. Where are they? Oh, they're all over the place. So anyway, so I'm still in the oil business. I'm in Babylon, New York is where our corporate headquarters was. <laughs> now, I get filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm getting filled with the Spirit. They got me praying in tongues, and I'm on charismatic revival land here. And uh, I go to a full gospel of businessmen's meeting, and I'm like, you know, 20 years old, and a guy, Israeli guy, comes off the platform, bounces off the platform. God's going to use you to reach your people. I said, Episcopalians? <laughs> because that's all I knew. I thought... Well, I guess everyone has a destiny. Mine's kind of a dud, but I'll do it. <laughs> Here's a flame of fire reaching Episcopalians all over the world. So uh, I said, Episcopalians? He goes, no, Jews. I go, and why would I be reaching Jews? And I sound like a New York Jew. I look like a New York Jew. Why would I be reaching? And he looks at me and smiles. He says, why don't you call your father right now and ask him? I asked my father. I call him up. I go out in the lobby of the Hershey Hotel, pick up the phone. Hey, Dad, I'm over here with these Pentecostal people. I know you don't understand it, but sometimes they say things, and it's kind of interesting. One of them said to me that I was going to reach my people. I said, Episcopalians. He said, no Jews. I said, why Jews? He said, go call your father and ask him. <laughs> so there's this pause. My dad said, well, your brothers didn't ask that question. I'd appreciate it if you didn't bring it up to them, and if you come home, we'll discuss it. <laughs> oh, boy. I knew I was in for something, so I go home, and he shows me, like, the printout. You know, your, your aunt's into this thing, you know, I'm not really into it, but yeah, sure, my father was Jewish, I guess you probably need to know that. And it's the lineage over here, and there's all these Cohens, and, 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 and first name is Moses with a bunch of them. I'm thinking, well, that, that's a giveaway right there, Dad. <laughs> right there, I could have figured that one out if I'd seen that earlier in life. So it's Moses and the Cohens, and... Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm realizing, look, we've got rabbis on that side of the family. I said, well, he said, well, look, he said, I was, so I was persecuted. He said, my dad married a Gentile. And he said, so none of the Jews would associate with me because I was a half-breed. And, and all the Gentiles were beating me up because I was a Jew. He said, I had pain on both sides of my religious tradition. And he, I said, well, actually, dad, with my group, Jews are pretty in. It's okay. <laughs> it's just so surreal. It's like, yeah, my group likes Jews. Matter of fact, half of them, uh, they're all claiming they are, even if they aren't. 
So anyway, that's when he tells me something. This is always amazing how these conversations start. He says, well, now that you mention it, uh, I guess I should tell you, you have, a, you have a sister. What? I got two brothers I grew up with, and suddenly I have a sister. He said, well, it's complicated. World War II, I was in Anzio, Second World War, like he was at Patton, he was with Jimmy Doolittle, he was in the Air Force. He said, I got separated from my uh, troops. He said, I was staying, I went in the, kind of in the French Italy, French underground for a while. Basically, I was living in this house, and uh, well, anyway, I, was, uh, I ended up marrying this girl, and uh, she got pregnant, and, uh, and she had a daughter, and she wants to meet her brothers. I go, my God, that's an amazing discovery. He said, well, I'll fly you down if you want to meet her. So I fly down. I find out I've got like a half-sister in Israel with a whole tribe of like 20 nieces and nephews in Israel. It's crazy. So uh, I realize I want to go into ministry, but I'm in Babylon, New York. I'm just going to make this real quick because people don't know who I am. I'm in Babylon, New York, and I'm walking around. The only thing I can think of is the Bible mentions Babylon, and it basically says, come out of her, my people. My friends are in Christ for the Nations. They're in Elam Bible College. They're in all these cool Bible colleges. I couldn't get into the Bible colleges. The only Bible college I could get into was Philadelphia College of the Bible, and they required me to sign a statement saying that I did not speak in tongues. Well, you can imagine how far that went. I said, <laughs> So, off we go. So I, I figured, I honestly figured, I'm not qualified to be. This is true. You've got to beat yourself up. I feel, well, I guess I'm a businessman. My job is to pay for ministries. The Lord knows I am so dysfunctional. I'm probably not in a minister. I'm not a preacher. I'm a business guy. But really what the Lord was saying is you're in future school because where I'm going to move is going to be, you don't get it now, but I'm going to be moving in the marketplace. I'm going to be in the marketplace. I'm going to be in the world system. And I kept thinking that in order to serve God as a devoted bride and beloved uh, son, I needed to exit the system. I had it half right. I had to exit like Moses, leave Egypt so I could go back in. But going back in is what we're supposed to do, not live in the wilderness, indulging fantasies of an awakening that never happens. So I said, all right, in Babylon, I started walking around the building and praying in the Spirit. I figured the sooner I get this assignment done, the faster I'll get in my ministry. It's whatever that is in the marketplace. So I walk around, walk around, but you know what happens is you walk around a building, every place the sole of your foot, dread, the, the Lord gives to you. So I was walking around the building, praying in the Spirit, next thing you know, uh, it's really weird how this stuff happens. But I was praying in tongues. I take the company situation, I lay this stuff down, here's the problems with the company, and, uh, and uh, next thing you know, I started getting ideas. I had these unusual ideas. I had ideas that made the company lots of money, and I started hiring people, and then when I hired them, I led them to Jesus, and so I'm walking around. We're having like a revival inside the company. People are getting saved. The company's prospering, and, and, and this is for real in Long Island, New York, in Babylon, and right off the Jericho Turnpike. It's a real thing. <laughs> right off the Jericho Turnpike in Babylon, New York. That's the, I'm literally. How many of you know I'm talking a real thing? I'm not making this up, right? So, I'm, I feel like Michael Corleone. Every time I was trying to get out, I kept getting pulled in because the corporate office said, we love it, we love it, do another one. So I'm going all over the place, walking around buildings, praying in tongues and hiring people and, and building the business. And I thought, this is, I'm never going to get out of here at this rate. <laughs> so I just made the decision at one point that uh, I was going to go into being a holy man. I was going to pastor. I couldn't pastor, but I could do worship leading. I used to lead a, I used to worship on a piano. So I took off in Philadelphia, left. But my dad thought I was crazy. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, I must answer the call of God. I thought the call of God was out of the world entirely. I felt like the more faith you had, the more you separated yourself from any predictable form of income and live by faith. Because that's kind of what you get taught. And so I had this weird dichotomy between the world and the spirit, the spirit and the world. And I didn't want to be contaminated with the world. I wanted to be in the spirit. So I go and, uh, and I'm pastoring. I'm an assistant pastor, a worship leader, and my pastor was a deliverance ministry. Now I don't want to get you confused here, but this guy had more appointments to cast out devils than he could handle, so he gave the leftover appointments to me. <laughs> I'll tell you what. There's nothing weird you could do that I haven't already seen at some point. <laughs> I'm very ecumenical. I could, take, I could tolerate pretty much anything going on. So... 
we had a deliverance church, we had a faith church, we had a preaching church, and it was over an auto body shop. <laughs> and in the winter, to save money, the guy was working on cars, and he shut the garage door to keep it warm, and all the fumes came upstairs. <laughs> so in order to deal with the fumes, we had fans, we'd open the windows. And I was the worship leader, and the fans were kind of low. And I would notice as the anointing increased, people would be lifting up their hands, and the taller people would put their hands into the fans. <laughs> I just got this feeling that this isn't really the call of God on my life. Something about this is not measuring up. <laughs> Something's very suspicious. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not in ministry. I'm a consultant. That's it, a, a consultant. See, a consultant is different. So I became a, a ministry consultant. I was a ministry consultant. That's when I met Graham. I was a ministry consultant. I was consulting this church, and then the pastor left. <laughs> it's kind of awkward. It's kind of like the guy leaves, hands you the bag, and you're there on the platform with it. So I kind of hung around until we could find someone to give the church to. 20 years later. But that's the problem with prophecies, because you get prophecies. God's going to do this, God's going to do that, and you want to hang on until the prophecy happens. And you're seeing stuff happen, so you're waiting for the stuff that didn't happen yet to happen. And finally, I got friends of mine pulled me aside. I don't know if Graham did. Graham was always very... Graham was great. My kids used to wrestle with him in my house. He used to remind me the other night. They were back in the World Wrestling Federation days, and they used to wrestle Graham on a mat in my basement. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's for real. Anyway, I was doing the church consulting, but what happened was I had friends in the United Nations, and I had friends in business and universities that would call me because I used to be in the oil business. I was an HR guy. I used to build companies and do resource consulting and training. And so they'd call me in, and I thought, I don't want to go to the United Nations to do training because as far as I'm concerned, that's part of the beast system. <laughs> and then they explained to me, no, 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 Lance, it's not like that at all because these are NGOs, non-government operations. So they, you know, they do all kinds of benevolent stuff. So I went and did some stuff with the United Nations, and I was teaching at the, you know, some university stuff. And, and that was when I got this realization, listening to Bill Bright, listening to the guys that led me to the Lord, listening to Francis Schaeffer, listening to Chuck Colson, listening to Lauren Cunningham. And I realized they're talking about these discipling nations, and it's done through the media. And you realize something? That whoever controls media and arts and, 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 and the uh, youth culture determines what's cool. And so the real mischief is if we don't show up downstream. So all politics is downstream from culture, which means that if the culture is taken over by people that are saying it's really cool if you're LGBT, this is really interesting. It went from being a question lifestyle to being a tolerated and, and let's include people to being a promoted alternative so that kids think it's trendy to be gay. Because whatever is cool in arts and culture ends up becoming viral within the, within the, uh, the, the nation, and it eventually finds an empty suit that will, that will uh, get votes for it. And this is, this is the mischief. So I started looking at this and thinking, I've never seen a revival. I started thinking about it. We talk about revival and awakening, but we really got this. The bride of Christ is an army. We have to be totally devoted to Jesus, so our driving passion is him, but we have to be able to engage in the battle for nations by going into the system. Does that make sense? you got to go into it. You can't, you can't fight this battle by being out of it. And I went all the way around and I asked the Lord, why did I do that? The Lord said, because I had to take you out to take you in. I had to take you all the way into the, the realm of uh, ministry so that you could go out and see that you have to disciple these fears. You have to raise up believers in these places. You have to make them strong. Does this make sense to you? Your devotion to Jesus should lead you into warm, proximate contact with the battle over the minds and hearts of people. And the reason why it's so important to do this now is because I think about, why am I doing this? Why do I even want to do this? Why do I want to escalate uh, problems in my life by, I don't have to do this. But then, you know, the Lord took me to an interesting verse. I encourage you to think about this. Three times Jesus got up in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he went up and he looked at his disciples. And I'm looking at that. Three times he got up in the garden and went to the disciples. Why did he get up three times to go to see them? 
Well, some people say, you know, because he said, well, couldn't you watch me one hour? People were th some people think, well, Jesus was in a tremendous conflict. The blood mingling with perspiration on his brow, the stress, the cosmic conflict that was compressed into the humanity of the Messiah. He's fighting all hell as a man, not as God. So it's all converging in him. And the Greek makes this uh, terminology, it's like a head plunged underwater with no escape, no oxygen, no way, no way to get out of it. And he's, he's immersed in this battle. He gets them three times to look at the, go see the disciples. Is it A, in order to get them to become prayer partners with him because of the stress he's under? That's why I used to think he's getting them, couldn't you pray? Like I need, couldn't you pray? But then I look at what he says. Pray for the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. He's worried about them, not him. Because he knows what's about to hit them while that when they wake up. Third time, rest on and take your sleep on, and take your rest. And then it occurred to me, do you know why he did that? I believe it's for the same reason you and I need to have a conversation. Because when you are called upon to pay an extreme price, you have to make sure you keep in focus the reason why you're paying that price. Because the temptation to compromise on that price is proportionate to the amount of value you see in, 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 in enduring the price. So for the joy that was set before him, he endured. What was the joy that was set before him? I would suggest to you, having loved his disciples, he loved them to the end. He kept getting up to go back and look at why he had to go back in. He kept getting up to go see face to face, those whom he most cherished and loved, who he knew personally, although he loved all, let's get this right, as a man, these were the ones the Father gave him. He had a special affection for them. He had to see the faces of those who he loved, just like, who would that be for you? I'll tell you who it is, it's your children. Because when I think of my children, I, let's face it, I, I'm, I'm willing to suffer inconvenience for you, but I'm not necessarily gonna die for you. I may have to. Uh, but I'll die for Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, if it's a sustained price every day and a choice, it has to be something in very close proximation to my imagination that I'm thinking about. And you know what that is? It's my children. I honestly believe that Jesus rose up in order to see the reason why he had to go back in and not stop until he broke through. Now, this is a beautiful contemplation because what it means is that Jesus' motivation wasn't dominion, wasn't world conquest, it wasn't some abstract glory he was going to have in eternity. It was actually the redemption of those whom he loved. You have to have a why that makes you cry, is what I'm saying. Because at some point, you'll check out. You will pay the price. So I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, now, wait a second. If this is true, and I believe it is, then that explains why it is that I'm willing to continue pressing in and encouraging you to get involved with the battle. Because your sons and daughters, it was the exhortation I heard earlier, every battle we don't fight, every, every, every Goliath we leave standing is just another giant our sons and daughters are going to have to deal with. I cannot afford to have a, a theology that disengages me from the battle so that I can enjoy not having to fight and then find out at the end of my days that I've left unresolved conflict for my sons and daughters to endure. I don't want them saddled with $25 trillion worth of debt. I don't want to see America go through a Great Depression. I don't want to see us going into where we could go unless believers actually exert their influence in the proportion in which they represent the population of the country. Does that make sense to you? So, let me just drill down the remaining, remaining time that I have it. From Babylon all the way into ministry, all the way into seeing the seven mountains and, and working with nations and realizing, wait, to disciple nations, we have to go into institutions. Because politics is downstream from culture and whoever has academia, whoever has media, whoever has the arts is going to shape the government. And I was with a nervous Christian on a Christian television who wanted me to talk, but didn't want me to talk about anything controversial. It's always very difficult to know what that means. Like, don't say anything controversial, but feel, take your liberty. Take your liberty, but don't say anything I, that makes trouble. I was like, and the Lord gave me a word of wisdom. He said, I don't want to get political. I said, I agree. Let's not get political. Because it's not about politics. The Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulders. It's not about politics. It's about the government. And it's about the kingdom of God versus other kingdoms. And if you really pay attention, you're going to see that Satan is actually, what you're up against is almost like a counterfeit religious movement. I want you
you to think about that. That young people today are being taught that there's a utopia that's possible. That utopia is actually the kingdom of God. But they're taught to reject Christianity. So they think the utopia is achieved through being able to acquire power. If they can acquire power, they can wrest power out of the greedy and redistribute the power to the people that need it. The only problem is it will always get redistributed again to an elite that control the power. But you will lose your freedom. Free enterprise is the greatest promise in the world for the creation of wealth. It has done more to alleviate poverty. It's literally taken China and India and made it a nation, to two nations that no longer, that now have a middle class because free enterprise and capitalism literally lifts. It's part of the Judeo-Christian imagination. Socialism is the bloated authority of government taking the place of God and demanding the generosity of people. Instead of generosity coming from the church engaging social ills, the government will become the church that engages the social ills. But uh, you, no one will spend your money as thriftily as you will. And so when someone else has money, they spend it sloppily and the government will spend it badly. And what I'm talking to you about actually isn't non-religious subject matter. These are the ideas we should be conversing on because we're talking about worldviews regarding how the Bible talks about solving problems versus alternative ways. And the Bible addresses every single problem facing humanity right now. Does that make sense to you? And the bride who is terrible as an army with banners is actually giving the bridegroom what he wants. And that means we're engaging the battles that are in nations right now. And we're actually thwarting darkness from occupying the hearts and minds of the next generation and militizing them and making them militant against Christian values. We're actually going to, we're going to be a, a movement that's going to make uh, Jesus Christ beautiful to the nations because Jesus Christ should be exalted. He should be the desire of nations. We should be unveiling him so that people see how beautiful he really is. Like the young man that got me, got me uh, I got saved because he demonstrated something. Are you, catch, are you with me so far? All right, let's just go through some Bible verse. I know it's after lunch, but I want to give you a biblical foundation for this. Psalm 2 is the psalm for the resurrection. The reason I know that is because Acts 4, the disciples quote it, the apostles, when they're preaching. They say, look at this. Pontius Pilate and Herod and the Jewish leaders all conspired together in order to create a triangulation against the Messiah. What does it say? Acts chapter 4, verse 25. The Holy Spirit said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're quoting Psalm 2. They're saying Psalm 2 deals with the resurrection of Jesus. Psalm 2 deals with the trial of Jesus. So we ought to take a look at Psalm 2, don't you think? Let's go ahead. Take a jump over to Psalm 2. Since the apostles were so ambiguous about linking Psalm 2 with the resurrection of Christ and the gospel they preached right there in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. So Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their fetters. I'm not going to drill down long on this, but I'm going to tell you something. I really believe that in the news today, you're watching news, really, if somebody, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for people. I'm actually looking at getting a Newsmax program. I'm going to become like the Trump whisperer, but I'll have to change it when he's no longer in office. Because most believers don't know how to read the headlines of what's happening and translate it into the spiritual warfare over nations. I could take every nation right now and thread it through the Word of God and show you the news in light of the Word and the spiritual battle over nations. It's all that it requires is a Sherpa guide to take you and show you this is what's happening. Do you see it? So right now, what do you have? You have rulers really in our own nation trying to break off the chains of an administration that they do not want, which is weird because all this administration so far has done is increase the, uh, the economic well-being of the country and decreased the unemployment for the African-American and Hispanic community. All that it's doing is it's saying that you need to have borders so that you can keep out the bad people and invite in the good. This is common sense. This isn't even a philosophical argument about generosity. This is about what kind of people do you actually want to have in the nursery? Is there a vetting process or do you just let whosoever will may come? No, you actually determine who gets access to your kids. That's the same thing when you're a ruler of a nation. You determine who comes in. And it doesn't mean you don't want people in. It means you want to be able to know who they are and what, what mischief they're bringing with them in case the devil is sending them in. So anyway, I want you to keep reading here. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs. He rebukes them in his anger. He terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. So basically, the Lord above is saying, 
I put Jesus in the position he's in, it's really not up for a vote. Psalm 2. I will proclaim the decree. He, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Or this day I have begotten you. Look at verse 7. You know what that's referring to? This is referring to the first conversation the father had with Jesus when he came out of the tomb. He opens his eyes and the father says, today I have brought you. Remember what Jesus said? Into thy hands I commit my spirit. What does that mean? He refused to, he refused to exercise his authority over his own destiny. Had the father not taken him up out of hell, he would have remained in hell. He died like you died, completely at the mercy and the integrity of God. And so he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And the father, after the three days, pulled him up out of the grave. Why do we know that that's what happened? Because it says in Ephesians, he that ascended first descended. He went down and the father brought him up. And what does the father say? Today I brought you up. The father says to him, now watch this. I be, today I'm your father. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. First thing the Father says is, ask of me. Because I'm giving you, why would the Father say to Jesus to ask of him? So it's the first conversation. Why? I'll tell you what my theory is. Because Jesus never asked for this previously. If he had asked for it, he would have, it would have been unnecessary to ask again. Jesus doesn't ask, you know, not get the prayer answer. So evidently, this is important, Jesus' main focus in his earthly ministry was not nations. His main focus was the treasure buried in the field. His main focus was you, which is why he got up three times to go look at his disciples. He was looking at you. He was saying, that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it for glory. I'm not doing it to prove my enemies are wrong. I'm not doing it to, to let Rome know I'm more powerful than, than, than Caesar. I'm doing it for them. I'm paying the price for the bride. I'm picking up the tab for the treasure in the field. I'll take the treasure, and, uh, and, and that's it. I pray for you, he said in, in John 17. I don't pray for the world. I pray for those whom thou hast given me, for all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. I do not pray for the world, I pray for them. Those, he was praying for you. He was looking at the disciples because you were what he was looking at. He was looking at the ones he was dying for. So the Father says, noble, beautiful, perfect. You did this for them, but I'm going to give you more than them. I'm giving you the whole earth as your possession. The earth may have rejected you and you purchased the bride, but guess what? Along with the bride, you will get the nations for your inheritance. You will get the nations. In time, there'll be a decision between sheep and goats, and then you'll return and it will all be yours. You're not going to go through eternity with people voting for you or against you. You're going to come back and it will all be yours. But in that time, you will separate them. Now, I'm asking you to update your theology to realize Jesus is being told in the resurrection ask, I'm going to give you nations. Because I think we need to update our theology from some ambiguous revival and a harvest of souls that we can never put faces to, to seeing we can measure the transformation in souls and nations, because nations now are easy to understand once you have this paradigm. Because you can see whether nations are moving towards goat or sheep status. You can see how effective the church is, and you can see where the battle lines are. You can see where the church needs to be an influence. Does that make sense? Pray for rulers and those who are in authority that we may lead a godly and peaceful life. Pray for all rulers and those in authority. I don't know why we think it's just a president in the cabinet. That's whoever is an influencer is someone you should pray for. If an artist, a director, a tech blogger, people that have a sphere of influence, pray for the influencers. Pray for those that are in authority. Why? So that you, your people, your city, your community, your nation can have a godly and peaceful life because nothing is more calculated to create hell on earth than a demonized leader stirring up trouble. Does that make sense? So Jesus answers the prayer. Father says to him, ask of me. Now he continues on for 40 days, teaching about the kingdom. The Great Commission now includes discipling nations, teaching nations. It's an interesting emphasis in his final days before he goes up because Jesus is updating them to the Father's agenda. And the agenda is going to be nations, teaching nations. Does this make sense to you? So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, wow, make the nations your inheritance. I'm interested in seeing how nations, that's why this, these, this, this 7M thing, this makes a lot of sense to me. I don't care if it's 7 or 8 or what you have, it's really going to be, it's still going to come down to who's controlling the media, who's controlling the arts, and how strong is the economy. 
I want to know whether governance and law is going to be reflective of freeing people or enslaving them. I want to know if education is poisoning and indoctrinating and defiling the minds of a generation or liberating them to entertain greater and nobler ideas. And I want to see how it's affecting the family structure and then how it's affecting religious liberty. And I realized something. Religious liberty is the number one issue that you have to focus on. Out of all the issues, what about the unborn? What about choice? What about abortion? What about same-sex marriage? Religious liberty is the key issue. You know why? As long as we're free to preach we can fight and overcome. The moment that they can't hear your voice, which is the danger of what's happening at Google and at YouTube and at Twitter and at Facebook right now, the moment that they can silence you, so, because the only weapon we have isn't the weapon of um, intimidation or the weapon of bribes with rewards, it's the weapon of persuasion. The one weapon we have is the weapon Jesus chose, which is the, which is the weapon of proclaiming the truth. So if they can keep you from being heard, they've marginalized the one thing that you do that makes a massive difference, which is communicating the truth. So here we are. We're in, we're in this place where I say, pick the vertical. Why is it that the religion issue is the big issue? Because if a nation ultimately is a sheep or a goat nation, it's going to manifest itself on whether or not it tolerates your right to exist. That's the defining issue of a sheep or a goat nation. I talked with some Christian leaders about this, and they were all confused. They said, Lance, I don't know if this is possibly, you know, uh, true for this or the millennium. I go, stop it, stop it. We're screwing everything up. You know what? Because the church needs to have clarity. It has to be able to update itself. What are we actually doing? Like those of you that, I understand this. There was a period of time I didn't vote. I didn't engage in civic duty. I was, I was a moron on current events because I didn't think it was relevant. Now I realize. I'm called to disciple nations. I need to know who is influencing the nation I'm called to influence. I need to know what the ideas are that they're propagating because those ideas can be extremely pernicious. They could be like arsenic. They could be a 3% error that is 90% deadly. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at sheep and goats. And finally, I said, well, these are good questions. Let's have a conversation. Let's go to, Psalm, let's go to Matthew 25. This is important because if we get this stuff down in our spirit, then you could be a bride that is giving to the bridegroom exactly because you're a powerful movement. You're in all these nations. There's nations watching right now, and there's a glory in every nation. And there's a competition for rulers, good rulers and bad rulers. I promise you, God will put Cyrus rulers out there. And they don't have to be Christians. They simply have to be people that have kingdom values. And you'll discover, as we found out with Trump and, and in history with Lincoln and with Churchill and with FDR and at different times in history, God will raise up champions on behalf of his people. We just have to identify who they are and not reject them because they're not one of us. Okay, so here's Jesus. He lays it out there. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. When's this going to happen? When he returns. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in glory. And all the nations, what does it say? Nations. Nations started off as tribes, and then they became city-states. Remember this, the evolution of nations. City-states. The Apostle Paul said, I am from Jerusalem and I am from Rome. He didn't say Italy and Israel, because Italy and Israel didn't exist. City-states existed. But in the wisdom of God, Acts 17 says that God has set the times and the boundaries. And when he said boundaries, what was he doing? He was prophetically saying, this present boundary isn't the final one. Because Florence and Rome are both in Italy. Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are both Israel. And then in the Peace of Westphalia, if you look around the 1550s, in Europe, uh, as a result of the conflict of uh, Reformation warfare, they came together and said, let us acknowledge the boundaries of nation states. And you began a new era where nations had boundaries and borders in which they could seek God and discover their glory. So here we are, Jesus is saying in this final iteration of nation states with boundaries. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates uh, the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep in his right hand, the goats in his left, and the king will say. Now, I can't tell you how many times, fortunately, I have this little thing on the inside of me. I may not always understand stuff, but I don't automatically sign off on theology if I don't get a witness on it. I'll go along with it because I don't know any better, but I have a hard time preaching something I don't have a revelation of. 
And I used to hear people always, especially when, I, listen, I've even done it. We're going to take up an offering now for the poor. We're going to take up an offering now for the homeless. We're going to take up an offering. And whenever you take up an offering for humanitarian cause, this is a great verse because it kind of confuses people. You're saved by faith and by grace, but the implication here is, well, you don't know. Because after all, if you're not caring about the poor and the sick and the infirm and the prisoner, what does Jesus say? You may be a goat, not a sheep after all, so we don't know if you really are a sheep or a goat, except if you have a generous heart. So here's a good test. Are you generous? It's, got, it's really a dumb way to take an offering, but it's done a lot. Because the teaching here is, watch this. The king says that uh, he's blessing them. And why is that? He says here, uh, and he says here, take a look at this, verse 35. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. Sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will say, Lord, when do we ever see you? Hungry, or thirsty, or needing clothes? He'll say, as much as you've done to the least of these. Well, this is crazy, now watch this. The king will say, I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine. The least of these, watch the language. Least of these, my brethren. Why is that language interesting? Because Jesus is drawing a circle around who the people is he's prophetically talking about. At the time he returns, goat nations are going to be rather brutal on sheep. And sheep nations are going to provide asylum for religious liberty. That's the issue you've got to get your head wrapped around. Because the issue here is how they treated his brethren. Now, I know the way that I used to teach this, based on some good social gospel teaching, was... And God identifies with all humanity, and therefore when you pass by the poor person, you're pass by Jesus. But actually, that's not good theology. Because when the Apostle Paul was persecuting the Christians, Jesus knocks them down on the road, uh, road, road to Damascus, and, and, and he knocks them down, and after he knocks them down, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul wasn't even persecuting Jesus. He was already, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, gone. He was persecuting the movement. Jesus said, forget the movement. When you persecute them, you're persecuting me. Remember this. The way they treat the body of Christ is the way they treat Jesus. So I'm thinking about Jesus teaching. He's there teaching, and there's a knock at the door. And while he's teaching, someone says, a master, your mother and your brothers are outside, and they wish to speak to thee. And he says, really? And who is my mother and who are my brethren? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples. Those details are important in the Bible. He says... He says, this is my mother, and this is my brother's. These are my brethren. For whoever hears the word of God and keeps it, that's my mother and that's my brother. What he's saying is, it's the disciples who are his brethren. As much as you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done to me. The way they treat the Christian. I'll go a step further. They cannot be anti-Semitic and pro-Christian. The two get lumped together. The way they treat the seed of Abraham is the way they treat the, the offspring of Abraham. So this ought to freak you out. The reason why Israel is an important issue, and I know some people get all schmaltzy and they go, well, Israel, it might have been Israel. People miss it. Israel is the litmus test of the nation's tolerance and, and attitude towards Jesus Christ because the way they treat the seed, the natural seed of Abraham, is the way they're treating the spiritual seed. They just haven't dealt with it yet because of economic reasons. This is important you catch this. I'm telling you, goat nations are going to persecute Jews and Christians. Sheep nations will not. Now you're not talking about a sheep nation being a saved nation. You're not talking about a sheep nation being a nation where everybody's a Christian. You're simply talking about a nation whose institutional uh, laws and governance will not endorse the malicious abuse of religious freedom amongst the Jew and the Christian. And trust me, around the world right now, it's not necessarily Hindus and Muslims and, and other faiths that are being pushed around, bullied, and surviving. It always comes down to Christians and Jews. Because the very nature of our passivity, our, our philosophy of nonviolence, makes us an easy target. You criticize Islam, you take your life in your hands, depending on where you go. You criticize Christianity on Saturday Night Live or John Oliver, it's open season, baby. We're an easy target. So I'm telling you. Go nation. So I met with Senator Sam Brown, or former Senator Sam Brown, now Ambassador to Sam Brownback, and we discussed religious liberty around the world. Why is religious liberty an important issue? Because at the end of the day, religious liberty is going to be what separates sheep nations from goat nations. Other policies can be what they are, but the freedom to not persecute or molest the church is an important freedom. Now let's bring it down to something more tangible. In this era of sheep and goat nations, 
I believe that nations are right now moving towards. They're based upon their policies regarding Israel and watch their policies of freedom of speech regarding Christians. You'll see more persecution, more fines, more legal hassles, and more restrictions on Christians. Thank God you got Donald Trump in there right now because what was heading towards Christians was going to be, I talked to mega churches totally lacking in the courage to get out and tell their people what to do and how to vote, but they already knew within 48 months they believed their tax-exempt status would be done by the, time that, uh, by the time four years were in an office. I had friends of mine telling me to be prepared for IRS probes into my own ministry and finances simply because of my political persuasions. They're, these are Washington people. Get your house in order. I thought, my God, look what they've done to Mike Flynn. Look what they've done to innocent people. Destroyed them. And we just move on because we're, we're largely illiterate on what's going on in this battle. But the Spirit of the Lord is actually raising up a, a remnant. Here's the other thing. The revival you're looking for, the Bible tells us where the revival is. The revival is actually among the remnant of those whom God has called. What that tells me is when you're looking for Charisma Magazine, another Toronto or a Pensacola or a Todd Bentley tent, or when you're looking for something that's going to be uh, uh, endorsed because so many people are in it, you might be missing the model. The actual model is if you read, if, and I'll show you in a second where it is, that among the remnant there is a revival because God anoints them to do the work. The work. Harvest is work. The harvest of nations is work. And you're anointed with reviving and, and prosperity so that you can do the work. Because the, God, because the Lord is bringing sheep nations in. Is this making sense to you so far? All right, so let's, let's go take a look at this. The, uh, so Donald Trump comes along, and like I said, he makes this tweet. He suddenly he does this, we're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And I'm not, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm thinking, oh, I should have guessed that, but watch this. The moment that he does this, United Nations begins to vote. As soon as Donald Trump says we're going to move the embassy to, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the whole world gets shaken. So if you want to see where this is, it's, I'm going to show you a pattern. How many believe that the Bible's loaded with patterns? Once you see them, it's obvious. Patterns and pictures increase your IQ because they predict trend lines. So take a look at Ezra chapter 1. Ezra's hard to find. It's right after Chronicles. It sneaks up on you in the Old Testament. But Ezra chapter 1, uh, right after uh, Second Chronicles, verse 1. Check this verse out. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by by Jeremiah the prophet, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is a phenomenal verse, considering the fact that guys like me were saying, Isaiah 45, the next president will be a Cyrus, and Donald Trump is a Cyrus, you watch. And then Netanyahu comes and says, and you are Cyrus. And now here we are, what does he do? He makes a decree that shakes the whole world, because the whole world goes into the valley of decision for the first round of voting on the right of Jewish people to exist as a state. El Salvador, North Korea, Haiti exists as a state. No one argues about it. When the Israelis come along, the nations go, I don't know if they have a right to exist but a capital in Jerusalem. Why? Because goat nations and sheep nations will define themselves on the basis of their disposition towards Israel and you. Trust me on this one. It's the news before it happens. I haven't missed it on this stuff yet. So here's what happens. The first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord by Jeremiah, what does that mean? That means that Jeremiah prophesied. Now check this out. Jeremiah prophesies, and Jeremiah the prophet prophesies. And because he prophesies, there's going to be 70 years, he says, until uh, the captivity in Babylon. And then what takes place? This is most interesting. Because Daniel, the, the, the intercessor, comes along. And Daniel starts to pray. Now Daniel comes along and, uh, and around the uh, 10th chapter, 9th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Daniel reads the prophecy of Jeremiah. And he says, oh my gosh, 70 years. This is amazing to me. That one prophet is honoring another prophet by reading his prophecies. And then as an intercessor, Daniel, it says it. Daniel in chapter 9. Daniel goes into intercession because just because the prophet said it does not mean it's going to manifest unless there is, a, there, is a, there is an intensity of agreement on earth for its manifestation. So Daniel goes into warfare and sets the angelic realm into conflict 
while he's pressing for the end of a cycle of 70 years. 70 years, Daniel prays. As Daniel is praying, boom, a disruption takes place and Cyrus comes into office and nobody expected him to go into Babylon. Suddenly, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the river surrounding the city of Babylon is dried up upstream and he marches in on the dry ground and he goes in under the foundations and Cyrus literally comes into Babylon. Now, this is important. We catch this. Because the prophet Jeremiah said so there's a 70-year cycle. But from 1947 to uh, 2017, Donald Trump shows up at the next 70-year cycle. Donald Trump, what, prophets prophesying for America, for revival, and I believe these prophecies actually are, there's an authorization in the utterance of prophets for something to happen. We see it right here. Jeremiah prophesied it, but it had to be pushed through. We've had prophecy. How many of you know we've had prophecy for 20, 30 years in the charismatic movement? Prophecy and prophecy and prophecy. I believe the heavens are pregnant with the preparation for an outpouring if the Daniels will push the issue through. So I remember I was just getting this live when Lou Engel was there. He goes, Lance, we were the Daniels. We were the ones who were pressing it through. I said, okay, 24-7. People praying. Prophets prophesying. Intercessors. These are the intercessor Daniels. The prophetic intercessors. How many prophetic intercessors do we have? So one person's saying it, and at the fullness of time, another one has to grab it and say, this is the moment. This is the right time. So there they, they start to pray. Cyrus comes through. The moment that Cyrus comes through, two stages happen. I believe we've had prophets that have been prophesying. I believe we've had intercessors that have been interceding. I'm convinced that Donald Trump was and is a fulfillment of an Isaiah 45, 45th President Cyrus. And I believe that this verse here, that Cyrus makes a decree, happened in our lifetime. And because we don't connect the dots, many Christians didn't even realize the United Nations was forced to go into a vote. And they had a special session deciding on whether or not this move was legal, whether or not it was accepted. Now watch this. I'm going to show you how this works. This is called the Valley of Decision. That's the Valley of Decision. Nations are lining up, and they're making their decisions known. Most Christians don't even, don't even observe uh, the numbers in terms of, like, what happens. So let's take a look at how this, uh, how this vote goes down, because it's kind of curious to me. In this vote... The United States steps out. Only nine nations voted with us. In spite of the hundreds of millions of dollars of aid that we go and the geopolitical implications, nine countries. And that includes the United States and Israel voting. Nine countries stood together for the right of Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. And the other nations that stood with us are kind of almost unusual. It's Toga, Micronesia. They're primarily eight islands. And Guatemala. Guatemala was curious about Guatemala is that it was the first nation that voted for Israel to exist in 1947. So now you see Guatemala as a sheep nation warring for its own existence. As Guatemala goes, so goes Central America. So we got nine countries that voted for, but here's a shocking thing. You have 128 nations voted against. And you should check this out where you've got chapters because you'd be shocked to find out that nations we thought were Christian influenced nations. It's like an update. It's a Holy Ghost update. 128 nations moving in the direction of goat alliances, alliances, unless we have a mighty move of the Spirit in the remnant in all these nations. Singapore is there. I can't believe Singapore. Much as we labor with pro Catholic uh, you know, uh, voters, the truth is, Italy itself voted against the right of Israel to have its embassy there in Jerusalem. You should take, take a look at the nation. And then here's another thing that fascinates me. We have 35 nations that wanted to avoid the battle entirely, so they just abstained from voting, including Australia. So what I'm trying to say to you is it's okay to see the data because it doesn't mean this is where it's going to stay. 
It just means that you should appreciate why if we don't get involved more tangibly in shaping the nations, the governments are going to make policies based upon how business is advising them, and Christians aren't influencing these systems because we disengage from them until we realize how indispensable it is that we should be protected by them. Then we rise up and push. And every time we rise up and push, there's a, there's a global surge that redefines what happens in nations. So we have that nine nations, 128 against, 35 abstain. I'm just telling you this because most, there's going to be more rounds of voting. But understand the issue is sheep and goat nations. Now Jesus is going to have sheep nations as his inheritance. That's why I'm looking at Hungary. That's why I'm looking at Brazil. That's why I'm looking at Poland. And we need to be looking at where these nations are that are, that are saying we want to find our Judeo-Christian roots. We want to establish our borders and our boundaries. We don't want to sign off on losing our sovereignty because nations are called to exhibit their glory. And the church is the indispensable agent in releasing the glory in the nations. Blessing and honor and glory and power and wisdom and riches and strength. Every one of those attributes corresponds to one of those realms of authority, whether it's business or academics or art or governance. We're called to go into every system. Just watch this for a second, though. The United Nations, the USA, right here, 20 trillion. This is so shocking. Most of us don't know. We have all the marbles for the first time in history. There was a moment in the movie Patton where, uh, where Patton says, he has exactly the right instrument at exactly the right moment in the exactly right time in history to be able to march all the way to Berlin. He could have circumvented a whole, you know, year of war if he had only had a few measly gallons of gas. But as a military genius, he saw we could go to Berlin right here and end this thing. But other people didn't see it. They couldn't see it. Right now, America is in a, is in a strange position. As much danger as we're in with deficits, we actually have all the marbles in history. It's a moment when if the Christians were stronger in shaping America as a culture, America could be birthing sheep nation alliances all over the world right now. Because we actually are undisputed in terms of our economic role. The dollar is the global currency. And uh, we have 20 trillion uh, in our economy. Uh, China has 11 trillion. It's amazing how just a picture can educate you real fast. So Donald Trump knows that China's only half the size of the United States, even though they say they're growing at 5, 6, 10 uh, percent know, every year. We're wondering if that's true, because they have no real physics backing the yuan. No, there's no physics behind their currency. In our case, we know what the, what, how the currency is evaluated. We, nobody knows how the currency is evaluated in China, because it's done by fiat. It's done by a government committee. So China is China's in an interesting position. People aren't really buying in yet on China's currency because they're not sure it's for real. The United States is indisputable at 20 trillion. Now watch this. You go down here, 5 trillion, 4 trillion, 3 trillion. You know what you got here? This is Japan. This is Germany. This is England. Take a look at how the world is working here. This is an atheistic system that is increasingly hostile to Christianity, is now refusing churches the ability to do what they do, children going to church, and is increasing the, the technological monitoring of their society, almost like the worst chapter of an Orwellian novel. And they consider Christian organization a threat to the concentration of power in the party elite. This is the system that is now competing with the United States. And all the sentimental China people out there that are just all happy about what the Lord's doing in China, they really don't know what's going on in China. I'll take you to the State Department and we'll discuss with people that are Christians what's really going on in China. And you realize the best thing for China is for the United States to maintain its strength as a nation. So you've got Europe over here, four, three, four, uh, five trillion dollars. Hardly a significant player compared to China over here, who's, who's, who has the aggregate uh, GDP to really match most, almost your, entire Europe. But nobody can compete with the United States. But here's the fun part. Watch this. I can never get a board that goes down low enough for this. Watch this. There's 170 to like 180 nations. This is so cool. That are not engaged in the global economy. They are outside of the game that is controlled by the banking systems. Chase Manhattan and Deutsche Bank, Swiss Bank, the big globalists playing the game. Betray. See, that's being done by players here and here and here. But look at this. Look at what the Lord's doing. As we speak, 
the Lord is actually looking at these nations, and these are where the emerging sheep nations are going to come from. There's a pool of like 170 nations out there that actually are up for grabs. And they could go one way or the other. There's a harvest of sheep nations right there. And you know what we're working on right now, which is kind of fascinating? A trading platform in the United States that says that if your nation will acknowledge the right of Israel to exist, then trade will be established between Israel, the United States, and your nation. It's happening right now. The first nation we met with, president of Guatemala, we met with his team. We're going to start with Guatemala. You know why? Because Guatemala is a sheep nation. How did Guatemala become, move its embassy? It's a fascinating story. One of the people on our team is the interpreter on the phone call that was between Benjamin Netanyahu and Jimmy Morales, the president of Guatemala. They called seven times, and the phone call dropped. It dropped because Jimmy Morales was going to say, now is not the appropriate time for us to make a decision on Guatemala. We eventually would like to, but at this point, our government is rather fragile. We're under siege in a lot of ways. Blah, 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 blah. But the woman who's the interpreter... Here's the Holy Spirit say, I'm the one dropping the call. Take the president aside and show him Matthew 25. She takes him aside. Very respectful, said, Mr. President, did you not say that if God, was going to make, if God would answer your prayer and you became president, that you would do what he told you to do when he told you to do it? He said, yes. Yeah. She said, could it be that this is one of those moments? And she says, as much as you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. His staff doesn't even realize what the interpreter is talking about. The phone call comes through. She sits back down. It's uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the President of Guatemala, the Sheep Nation, first vote for Israel to become a nation in 1947. He picks up the phone. He says, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm just wanting, I'm looking forward to telling you that we decided to move the embassy. And it's as though, she said, the words came out of his mouth before he could reclaim them. We're moving the embassy to Jerusalem. It's like, he was shocked he said it. It's out. And this is hilarious. Netanyahu's response. Oh, this is excellent news. Wait till I tell Brother Trump. Wait till I tell Brother Trump. So we met with him. We're setting, but look at this. We're going to set up, and then I'll wrap this thing up. We're going to set up, we're looking right now. There's individual states that are going to do business with these nations. We're looking for the sheep nations to create an alliance that would have Tel Aviv providing technology so that we can perhaps be using blockchain and various other technologies for these, for these nations that don't have uh, strong currencies, but to create single trade. We're starting the trade alliance to be able to do what? Remember in Genesis 17, Abraham was told, Sarah was told, you're the father of many nations. I'm going to bless the nations of the earth through you. It's not just a spiritual blessing. If it's a spiritual blessing, it, leads, it bleeds over into every other area of your life where Jesus wouldn't have spent half his ministry fixing people. It's taking care of your life. In other words, it's an economic. It's a medical. It's a, it's, a, it's a protection of God that comes over those nations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We're living in the hour when sheep nations are aligning. And by the way, here's the best part of it. I'm convinced that when Billy Graham passed away, 99 years of age, that that was the seminal moment, another prophetic moment that the church should have really understood. I know that we sentimentally said, well, there goes the great giant. But stop and think about this. This is the last time probably a preacher will ever be laid in honor at the center of the Capitol, and every politician, including those that don't like evangelicals, has to show up out of respect. <laughs> Donald Trump goes up, taps the coffin five times, which for us is grace, and releases a prayer proclamation. May God raise up a new generation of young male and female Billy Grahams. I want to get into Hungary. I've got an open door there. I've got an open door into Poland right now. I've been with Guatemala, Nicaragua. We have all these nations. I want to go for one reason. I want to talk about the trade alliance. I want to talk to the leaders about if they really want to see their nation prosper, they should be opening up to statesmen evangelists that can have arena meetings. Think about this. 
Billy Graham's primary contribution in history wasn't the uh, end of his life, it was the beginning. It was when he stood against the expansion of communist atheism and the ideology of uh, the Soviet Union, and they invited him to Beijing and to Moscow. And, to, and you know what they were doing? They were using him as a PR tool to show that they were actually open. And he allowed himself to be used because he knew that once he preached, it was a mutual agreement. They would use him and make him look like he's stupid, but he would take the gospel and get people saved. And that's the essence of why the Berlin Wall came down and why North Korea, and that's why South Korea became strong. And what I'm saying to you is this. I actually believe that not only are we going to see these sheep nations emerge, but I do think the stadium evangelism is going to happen. I am probably less thinking about that in the U.S. because I think that we're always, uh, we're, we're in the prophetic, we innovate the new path. And so we've got to do, so we can't default to what Billy Graham already did. But these other nations are going to have their Billy Graham moment when arenas will be filled. Now, why would, why would a Cyrus ruler want a statesman evangelist in an arena? Simply because the best antidote to anarchy is a people under the government of the Word of God. The best antivirus for populist, Marxist, unrest, and anarchy is the law of God and the Ten Commandments inscribed in the hearts and consciences of a people. And I can make that case to statesmen. I can make that case to politics. I understand how Cyruses think. They're not interested necessarily in, in the spiritual aspect. They want to know what the bottom line benefit is. Well, the benefit is this puts a, this puts a governance into your culture so that it can resist anarchy. You know, if they believe that, sign me up. They're going to want arenas, and we have to have people ready to go in and preach the gospel and know how to do it in a, such a way that they don't create a problem. That's Billy Graham as a statesman. By the way, Billy Graham was late. This is another ominous uh, word. Billy Graham is lying there in, 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 the, in the Capitol. Do you know the day that he was lying there in the Capitol? Most people miss this. He was lying there during the Feast of Purim. And here again, it's because, we, because we're operating off of an old paradigm. We don't know how to connect the dots. If you have this paradigm, you see connections all over the place. Billy Graham was lying there doing the Feast of Purim. What was the Feast of Purim? The Feast of Purim was when an edict was coming out in the government that was hostile to the Jewish people. Haman had issued an edict that the Jews would be killed. Esther, who was the patron ninja saint of all the ages, <laughs> is in proximity to government, but they didn't know she was a Jew until this moment. Now she reveals she's Jewish. And so the king basically gives her people the right to protect themselves. Purim is the feast where the Jewish people preserve their right to exist in a culture that wanted to wipe them out. And that's when Billy Graham was lying there, the great intercessor statesman, making a prophetic statement, in my opinion, saying, the era that I was here is no longer here. Now you must fight for your right to exist. American consensus is no longer around the gospel and the Ten Commandments. Now you're going to have to mount a vigorous defense of your faith if you're going to preserve your way of life. There were nine months between the Haman edict and the actual battle that was fought. The people of God had nine months to get ready. And what's interesting about that is it's nine months exactly now since Billy Graham died. And right now in the midterm elections, there's a whole lot of Americans that aren't even checked in to go vote. They're not even aware of the fact their, their freedom is being determined in a ballot box right now. But this is what happens when we disconnect the peace. So I'll give, I'll give you the final part of this. So if it's, what I'm saying is true, then Jeremiah represents the prophetic. Daniel represents the intercessor. Cyrus represent, represents the governmental leaders that God raises up for the sake of his people and for Israel. Then what follows after that? This is wild. You go to Haggai, you're going to see it. Right after that comes the remnant. You are the remnant. After Cyrus comes the remnant. The remnant is uh, Zerubbabel, not a well-known figure, and uh, Jerem, uh, who is it? And uh, Josiah, Joshua. Zerubbabel is, is a governmental Jewish leader. Joshua is the high priest. But the remnant... 50,000 of these people, they're the first wave of early adopters into occupying the new paradigm that God is opening up through the Cyrus era. 
And the Bible says in Haggai that the Spirit of God quickened and revived the remnant so that they could do the work. Think about this. It took a prophetic voice, Haggai, the prophet speaks to the government and to the church of that era that has a remnant seeing the historic moment to move with what God is doing. And they move forward. Right after Zerubbabel and Josiah begin restoring and rebuilding God's activity in his house in a new day, like new rain coming, new winds blowing, and I'm saying, get it clear as to what the rain and the wind is for because there's a specific work we're called to do in rebuilding nations. Right after that, Ezra comes along. What's Ezra? Ezra is a new breed of teaching prophetic voice that is educating and updating the people of God as to the timing, where they are and what they need to do. We're like right in that Zerubbabel, Ezra moment right now. And then what follows that? Because I'm telling you, the sequence is Zerubbabel, boom, Ezra, boom, Nehemiah comes right after that. And what was Nehemiah's task? This is crazy. Nehemiah had to build the wall. Now I know this. And to this day, you know he succeeded because there's Israel has no problem with Mexicans whatsoever. That's not a problem. <laughs> the reality is the wall isn't about Mexico. What's the wall about? It's not about border security necessarily. What's the wall? Proverbs 25. It says that a people without self-control is a city without walls broken into and, pl broken into and plundered. The wall represents the restoration of the capacity for self-governance of sheep nations. The wall represents the ability to protect the boundaries around what God has given you so that the enemy doesn't break through and rip you off. The wall is a metaphor for self-control or the ability of people to govern themselves. And when the people cease having the ability to govern themselves, they will be governed by somebody else who is a better concentration of power. Does that make sense? And so the physical wall certainly is a, is, is a characteristic of that. And it drives me nuts because some of my most spiritually enlightened friends, my, the people that, that, that are real revivalists in a way, they come along and they go, well, Lance, I'm more into building bridges than walls. It sounds so pious. But I'm thinking, well, let's just work this out for a second. When you say you're interested in building bridges and not walls, how does that work? At night, do you lock your door when you go to bed or are you interested in building a bridge to your unknown friends? When I pastored, I used to have somebody that signed people in and out of the nursery. We weren't interested in building bridges to people we didn't know. We wanted to make sure that you were the right person handling our kids. Do you want to have bridges into the recipes in the kitchen or walls? Do you want to have bridges into the cockpit where anybody can go in and fly the plane or somebody who's certified and can lock the door? I mean, think about this. You need both. What God was doing was he was restoring gates and walls. What are the gates? The gates are the way in which people come in and out. Gates of influence is how ideas come into a nation and ideas go out of a nation, and walls create the boundaries that protect the gates. Where we are now is actually we're building bridges and we're building walls. But you can't, you can't confuse metaphors because the battle right now is we're stuck right now is to, in a two-year period of time is this kind of Cyrus era going to be a momentary thing that we lose? Because the church, 60 million Christians uh, can actually affect this election. 20 million showed up in the last one. Only one-third. It's amazing. Only 50% are registered to vote and only half of them show up. But if 20 million show up, they could preserve the experiment. Because I'm telling you, the globe, sheep and goat nations, are actually being aligned right now, and a strong America has the marbles if we can preserve it, if we can keep it healthy. And I'm sorry to do this, we have so many nations that are watching this, but I go to your nations, and I know this, you want America to be strong so that the gospel can be, so the gospel is free in your countries. And so I'm praying, and I'm praying today, and I'm praying that you're, you're, you're joining me in this, that the remnant will be awakened to the work we're called to do. We don't have time to go into what the nature of that work is, but trust me, religious liberty is the secret. The final illustration is when the prairies, when they used to have prairie fires, they'd see the prairie fires coming at them from a distance. And the worst thing you could do if you're in the prairie crossing over into, into Oklahoma or through Nebraska and going to California, when you see that prairie fire, which could come from lightning, uh, could strike, it's suddenly fire, and the winds would blow 20 miles an hour. 
So what they would do is they would look on the horizon all the time for smoke because you had to move fast when there's a prairie fire. You could be cooked alive in the prairie. So what you would do, it's an amazing, amazing solution. What the, what the settlers learned they had to do, they had to, they had to literally run back to an area where they could burn and start the fire. They would start the fire, and then once the fire was started, imagine this, the fire would continue blowing behind them. They would back into the burnt up territory. So when the approaching fire came, and had nothing to consume. They would start a fire to stand in the burnt territory so that when the fire came at them, it couldn't consume the territory. They were standing in previously burnt ground. And I was listening to this illustration. I'm thinking this is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He actually took the sins of the world on him so that we could go to that ground. And when nations and judgment and shaking and the issues of things are going on, we have to learn how to find our ground that we back into that is the ground that God has already blessed because Jesus has already taken the curse for us. We back into that ground, and we have to learn how to stand in the finished work of what Jesus has done so that we can actually participate together in reshaping what's been. We are a rebuilding, a restoring generation. And there, there are parts of the culture that have come down. We're going to have to actually figure out how to work together to make them come back up. I told you earlier the idea. Two or more gather together. Two or three of you gather together in a sphere that God called you to. You can be the decisive ecclesia that brings the authority of God into that realm. It doesn't take many to be able to influence. I want to just pray for you as ambassadors right now. May we find the ground that God's given us and stand in it for religious liberty. Religious liberty is the burnt ground, folks. Christianity and the finished work of Christ is our burnt ground. We've got to stand there and protect it. We can't let that ever get taken from us. We lose religious liberty, and that's it. Father, I pray for the ambassadorship, heaven's ambassadorship. We have statesmen evangelists in this room. We have those that are going to be able to influence and persuade governments. We have those that have key access to the gatekeepers of influence. There's some of you that say, well, I don't know how I could ever do that. Trust me. Once you're available, you'll be shocked at how God can get a hold of you and put you where you never thought you'd be. I thank you, Lord, that Women's Aglow is the bride and the army, that this is an army that loves Jesus passionately and is willing to go where the fire takes them. I thank you for all the nations of the earth that are emerging sheep nations, for the harvest that is coming to those nations. I thank you, Lord, for the restoration of walls, boundaries, the recreation and restructuring of, of, of self-control and responsibility that, Lord, you're raising up a standard against the fire and you're building a wall of resistance against anarchy. And I thank you, Lord, that you're enlightening us. You're teaching us how to do this thing. Nations are the inheritance of the Lord. We're taught to disciple them. I pray for an upgrade of insight upgrade of IQ and upgrade of perception, spirit of wisdom, revelation and knowledge in these things that we'll suddenly see like we've never seen so we can say what's not been said under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. Those of you that uh, you can get uh, Trump, T-R-U-M-P, prophecy. Trump prophecy dot oh it's Cyrus prophecy thank you Cyrus prophecy I was going to say there's a movie called the Trump prophecy it's Cyrus prophecy is it dot com yep Cyrus prophecy dot com and I've got listed what I'm teaching here you can get access to it and I'll send it to you so you can get this and don't have to worry about it thank you thank you Thank you, Lord. Uh, he mentioned Abraham. I thought of, or maybe he even referenced Genesis 18. And it says there, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? As, you, as I was listening this afternoon, we were listening. I'm thinking, God is alerting us. We're not out to lunch in terms of what's happening, but God's brought Lance to us.
to uh, bring an incredible teaching. Get, get the tape, or the tape that's, <laughs> you know what I mean, the DVD, the CD. An incredible, incredible word. Thank you, Lance. Let's just, do you have a, a song or are we just closing in prayer? It's your call. Oh, really? Whatever you want. <laughs> I will do whatever you say. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your servant, Lance. We thank you for the word that you brought to us through him. We thank you that you're continuing to, uh, even as the scripture I just quoted, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? You're saying to your people, down through history, and you're saying it today, I'm not hiding from you. The things that are unfolding, the historical foundation, and what I am about to do. 